Walden Pond, Henry David Thoreau, The Bean Field. Meanwhile, my beans, the length of whose rows added together was seven miles already planted, were impatient to behold, for the earliest had grown considerably before the latest were in the ground. Indeed, they were not easily to put off. What was the meaning of this so steady and self-respecting, this small Herculean labor? I knew not. I came to love my rose, my beans, though so many more than I wanted. They attached me to the earth, and so I got strength like Antaeus. But why should I raise them? Only heaven knows. This was my curious labor all summer to make this portion of the earth's surface which had yielded only sinkafoil, blackberries, johnswort, and the like before sweet wild fruits and pleasant flowers produce instead this pulse. What should I learn of beans or beans of me? I cherish them, I hold them. Early and late I have an eye to them. And this is my day's work. It is a fine broad leaf to look on. My auxiliaries are the dews and the rains which water this dry soil. And what fertility is in the soil itself, which for the most part is lean in a fete, lean in a fate. My enemies are worms, cool days, and most of all woodchucks. The last have nibbled for me a quarter of an acre clean. But what, but what right had I to oust Johnswort and the rest and break up their ancient herb garden? Soon, however, the remaining beans will be too tough for them and go forward to meet new foes. When I was four years old, as I well remember, I was brought from Boston to this my native town, through these very woods and this field to the pond. It is one of the oldest scenes stamped on my memory, and now tonight my flute has waked the echoes over that very water. The pines still stand here older than I, or if or if some have fallen, I have cooked my supper with their stumps, and a new growth is rising all around, preparing another aspect for new infant eyes, almost the same Johnsworth springs from the same perennial root in this pasture, and even I have at length helped to clothe that fabulous landscape of my infant dreams, and one of the results of my presence and influence is seen in these bean leaves, corn blades, and potato vines. I planted about two acres and a half of upland, and as it was only about fifteen years since the land was cleared and I myself had got out two or three cords of stumps, I did not give it any manure, but in the course of summer it appeared by the arrowheads which I turn up in hoeing that an extinct nation had anciently dwelt here and planted corn and beans. Er, white men came to clear the land and so, to some extent, had exhausted the soil for this very crop. Before yet any woodchuck or squirrel had run across the road, or the sun had got above the shrub oaks while all the dew was on, though the farmers warned me against it, I would advise you to do all your work if possible while the dew is on, I began to level the ranks of haughty weeds in my bean field and throw dust upon their heads. Early in the morning I worked barefooted, dabbling like a plastic artist in the dewy and crumbling sand, but later in the day the sun blistered my feet. There the sun lighted me to hoe beans, pacing slowly backward and forward over that yellow, gravely, gravelly upland between the long green rows, fifteen rods, the one end terminating in a shrub oak corpse where I could rest in the shade, the other in a blackberry field where the green berries deepened their tints by the time I had made another bout. Removing the weeds, putting fresh soil about the bean stems, and encouraging this weed which I had sown, making the yellow soil express its summer thought in bean leaves and blossoms rather than in wormwood and piper and millet grass, making the earth say beans instead of grass, this was my daily work. As I had little aid from horses or cattle or hired men or boys or improved implements of husbandry, I was much slower and became much more intimate with my beans than usual, but labor of the hands, even when pursued to the verge of drudgery, but even even when pursued to the verge of drudgery, is perhaps never the worst from of idleness. It has a constant and imperishable moral, and to the scholar it yields a classic result, a very agricola. Laboriousus was I to travelers bound westward through Lincoln and Wayland to nobody knows where, they sitting at their ease in gigs, with elbows on knees and reins loosely hanging in festoons. I, the homestaying, laborious native of the soil, but soon my homestead was out of their sight and thought. It was the only open and cultivated field for a great distance on either side of the road. 
so they made the most of it and sometimes the man in the field heard more of traveler's gossip and comment than was meant for his ear being so late peace so late for i continued to plant when others had begun to hoe the ministerial husbandman had not suspected it corn my boy for fodder corn for fodder does he live there asked the black bonnet of the great coat and the hard-featured farmer reins up his grateful daubin to inquire what you are doing where he sees no manure in the furrow and recommends a little chip dirt or any little waste stuff or it may be ashes or plaster but here were two acres and a half of furrows and only a hoe for cart and two hands to draw it there being an aversion to other carts and horses and chin and chip dirt far away fellow travelers as they rattled by compared it aloud with the fields which they had passed so that i came to know how i stood in the agricultural world this was one field not in mr coleman's report and by the way who estimates the value of the crop which nature yields in the still wilder fields unimproved by man the crop of english hay is carefully weighed the moisture calculated the silicates and potash but in all dells and pond holes in the woods and pastures and swamps grows a rich and various crop only unreaped by man mine was as it were the connecting link between wild and cultivated fields as some states are civilized and others half civilized and others savage or barbarous so my field was though not in a bad sense a half cultivated field they were beans cheerfully returning to their wild and primitive state that i cultivated and my hoe played the rons de vaches for them Near at hand upon the topmost spray of a birch sings the brown thrasher or red mavis as some love to call him all the morning glad of your society that would find out another farm that would find out another farmer's field if yours were not here while you are planting the seed he cries drop it drop it cover it up pull it up pull it up pull it up but this was not corn and so it was safe from such enemies as he you may wonder what his ring marole his amateur paganini performances on one st string or, or on twenty have to do with your planting and yet prefer it to be <clears throat> and yet prefer it to leached ashes or plaster it was a cheap sort of top dressing in which i had entire faith as i drew a still fresher soil about the rows with my hoe i disturbed the ashes of unchronicled nations who in prime evil years lived under these heavens and their small implements of war and hunting were brought to the light of this modern day they lay mingled with other natural stones some of which bore the marks of having been burned by indian fires and some by the sun and also bits of poetry and glass brought hither by the recent cultivators of the soil when my hoe tinkled against the stones that music echoed to the woods and the sky and was an accompaniment to my labor which yielded an instant and immeasurable crop it was no longer beans that i hoed nor i that hoed beans and i remembered with as much pity as pride if i remembered at all my acquaintances who had gone to the city to attend the oratorios the night hawk circled overhead in the sunny afternoons for i sometimes made a day of it like a mote in the eye or in heaven's eye falling from time to time with a swoop and a sound as if the heavens were rent torn at last to very rags and tatters and yet a seamless cope remained small imps that fill the air and lay their eggs on the ground on bare sand or rocks on the tops of hills where few have found them graceful and slender like ripples caught up from the pond as leaves are raised by the wind to float in the heavens such kindredship is in nature the hawk is aerial brother of the wave which he sails over and surveys those his perfect air inflated wings answering to the elemental unfledged pinions of the sea or sometimes i watch the pair of hen hawks circling high in the sky alternately soaring and descending approaching and leaving one another as if they were the embodiment of my own thoughts or i was attracted by the passage of wild pigeons from this wood to that with a slight quivering winnowing sound and carrier haste or from under a rotten stump my hoe turned up a sluggish portentous and outlandish spotted salamander a trace of egypt in the nile yet are contemporary when i paused to lean on my hoe these sounds and sights i heard and saw anywhere in the row a part of the inexhaustible entertainment which the country offers on gala days the town fires its great guns which echo like pop guns to these woods and some waves of and some waves of martial music occasionally penetrate thus far to me away there in my beanfield at the other end of the town the big guns sounded as if a puffball had burst 
and when there was a military turnout of which I was ignorant, I have sometimes had a vague sense all the day of some sort of itching and disease in the horizon, as if some eruption would break out there soon, either scarlatina or canker rash, until at length some more favorable puff of wind making haste over the fields and up the Wayland Road brought me information of the trainers. It seemed by the distant hum as if somebody's bees had swarmed, and that the neighbors, according to Virgil's advice, by a faint tintabellum upon the most sonorous of their domestic utensils, were endeavoring to call them down into the hive again. And when the sound died quite away, and the hum had ceased, and the most favorable, favorable breezes told no tale, I knew that they had got the last drone of them all safely into the middle sex hive, and that now their minds were bent on the honey with which it was smeared. I felt proud to know that the liberties of Massachusetts and of our fatherland were in such safe keeping, and as I turned to my hoeing again I was filled with an inexpressible confidence and pursued my labor cheerfully with a calm trust in the future. When there were several bands of musicians, it sounded as if all the village was a vast bellows and all the buildings expanded and collapsed alternately with the din. But sometimes it was a really noble and inspiring strain that reached these woods, and the trumpet that signed and the trumpet that sings of fame, and I felt as if I could spit a Mexican with a good relish, for why should we always stand for trifles, and look round for a woodchuck or a skunk to exercise my chivalry upon. These martial strains seemed as far away as Palestine, and reminded me of a march of crusaders in the horizon with a slight tantivy and tremulous motion of the elm tree tops which overhang the village. This was one of the great days, though the sky had from my clearing only the same overlastingly great look that it wears daily, and I saw no difference in it. It was a singular experience that long acquaintance which I cultivated with beans, what with planting and hoeing, and harvesting and threshing and picking over and selling them, the last was the hardest of all. I might <clears throat> I might add eating, for I did taste. I was determined to know beans. When they were growing, I used to hoe from five o'clock in the morning till noon, and commonly spent the rest of the day about other affairs. Consider the intimate and curious acquaintance one makes with various kinds of weeds, and will bear some iteration in the account, for there was no little iteration in the labor, disturbing their delicate organization so ruthlessly, and making such invidious instinctions and making such invidious distinctions with his hoe, leveling whole ranks of one species and sedulously cultivating another. That's Roman wormwood, that's pigweed, that's sorrel, that's piper grass. Have at him, chop him up, turn his roots upward to the sun, don't let him have a fiber in the shade. If he do, he'll turn himself to other side up and be as green as a leek in two days. A long war, not with cranes, but with weeds, those Trojans who had sun and rain and dews on their side. Daily the beans saw me come to their rescue, armed with a hoe, and thin the ranks of their enemies, filing up the trenches with weedy dead, many a lusty crest waving Hector, that towered a whole foot above his crowding comrades, fell before my weapon and rolled into the dust, and rolled in dust, in the dust. Those summer days which some of my contemporaries devoted to the fine arts in Boston or Rome, and others to contemplation in India, and others to trade in London or New York, I thus, with the other farmers of New England, devoted to husbandry. Not that I wanted beans to eat, for I am by nature a Pythagorean, so far as beans are concerned, whether they mean porridge or voting, and exchange them for rice. But perchance, as some must work in fields, if only for the sake of tropes and expression, to serve a parable maker one day, it was on the whole of rare amusement which continued to long might have been a dissipation, though I gave them no manure and did not hoe them all once. I hoed them unusually well as far as I went and was paid for it in the end, there being in truth, as Evelyn says, no compost or latation whatsoever comparable to this continual motion, repastination and turning of the mold with the spade. The earth, he adds elsewhere, especially if fresh, has a certain magnetism in it, by which it attracts the salt, power, or virtue, call it either, which gives it life, and is the logic of all the labor and stir we keep about it, or sustain us all dungings and other sordid temperings, being but the vicars succeeding Succedaneus, succedaneus, 
to this improvement. Moreover, this being one of those worn out and exhausted layfields which enjoyed their Sabbath, had perchance, as Sir Canelm Digby thinks, likely attracted vital spirits from the air. I harvested twelve bushels of beans. But to be more particular, for it is complained that Mr. Coleman has reported chiefly the expensive experiments of gentlemen farmers, my outgoes were for a hoe, fifty four cents, plowing, harrowing, and furrowing, seven dollars and fifty cents, too much, beans for seed, three and a three dollars and twelve and a half cents potatoes one dollar and thirty three cents peas forty cents turnip seeds six cents white line for crow fence two cents horse cultivator and boy three hours one dollar horse and cart to get crop seventy five cents in all fourteen dollars and seventy two and a half cents my income was patrim familias videcum non non emicum S or Portet. My income was from nine bushels and twelve quarts of beans sold, <clears throat> sixteen dollars and ninety four cents, five large potatoes, two fifty, nine small, two twenty five, grass, one dollar, stocks, seventy five cents, in all twenty three dollars and forty four cents, leaving a pecuniary profit as I have elsewhere said of eight dollars and seventy one and a half cents. This is a result of my experience in raising beans. Plant the common small white bush bean about the 1st of June in rows 3 feet by 18 inches apart, being careful to select fresh, round, and unmixed seed. First look out for worms and supply vacancies by planting anew. Then look out for woodchucks if it is an exposed place, for they will nibble off the earliest tender leaves almost clean as they go. And again, when the young tendrils make their appearance, they have notice of it and will shear them off with both buds and young pods sitting erect like a squirrel but above all harvest as early as possible if you would escape frost and have a fair and salable crop you may s save much loss by this means this further experience also i gain i said to myself i will not plant beans and corn with so much industry another summer but such seeds that the seed is not lost as sincerity truth simplicity faith innocence and the like and see if they will not grow in this soil even with less toil and manurance and sustain me for surely it has not been exhausted for these crops alas i said this to myself but now another summer is gone and another and another and i'm obliged to say to you reader that the seeds which i planted if indeed they were the seeds of virtues were worm-eaten or had lost their vitality and so did not come up commonly men will only be brave as their fathers were brave or timid this generation is very sure to plant corn and beans each new year precisely as the indians did centuries ago and taught the first settlers to do as if there were a fate in it i saw an old man the other day to my astonishment making the holes with a hoe for the seventieth time at least and not for himself to lie down in but why should not the new englander try new adventures and not lay so much stress on his grain his potato and grass crop in his orchards raise other crops than these why concern ourselves so much about our beans for seed and not be concerned at all about a new generation of men we should really be fed and cheered if when we met a man we were sure to see that some of the qualities which i have named which we all prize more than those other productions but which are for the most part broadcast and floating in the air had taken root and grown in him here comes such a subtitle and and ineffable quality for instance as truth or justice throw the slightest amount or new variety of it along the road our ambassadors should be instructed to send home such seeds as these and crong it <clears throat> and congress help to distribute them over all the land we should never stand upon ceremony with sincerity we should never cheat and insult and banish one another by our meanness if there were present the kernel of worth and friendliness we should not meet thus in haste most men i do meet at all most men i do not meet at all for they seem not to have time they are busy about their beans we would not deal with a man thus plodding ever leaning on a hoe or a spade as a staff between his work not as a mushroom but partially risen out of the earth something more than erect like swallows alighted and walking on the ground and as he spake his wings would now and then spread as he meant to fly then close again so that we should suspect that we might be conversing with an angel 
Bread may not always nourish us, but it always does us good. It even takes stiffness out of our joints and makes us supple and buoyant when we knew not what ailed us to recognize any generosity in man or nature, to share any unmixed and heroic joy. Ancient poetry and mythology suggest at least that husbandry was once a sacred art, but it is pursued with a reverent haste and heedlessness by us our object being to have large farms and large crops merely we have no festival nor procession nor ceremony not accepting our cattle shows and so-called thanksgivings by which the farmer expresses a sense of sacredness of his calling or is reminded of its sacred origin it is a premium in the feast which tempt it he sacrifices not to ceres and the terrestrial jove but to the infernal plutus rather by avarice and selfishness and a groveling habit from which none of us is free of regarding the soil as property or the means of acquiring property chiefly the landscape is deformed husbandry is degraded with us and the farmer leads the meanest of lives he knows nature but as a robber cato says that the prof but the <clears throat> cato says that the prophets of agriculture are particularly pious or just maximique pious aquestus and according to Varro, the old Romans called the same earth mother in Ceres and thought that they who cultivated it led a pious and useful life and that they alone were left of the race of King Saturn. We are wont to forget that the sun looks on our cultivated fields and on the prairies and forests without distinction. They all reflect and absorb his rays alike and the former make but a small part of the glorious picture which he beholds in his daily course. In his view, the earth is all equally cultivated like a garden. Therefore, we should receive the benefit of his light and heat with a corresponding trust and magnanimity. What though I value the seed of these beans and harvest that in the fall of the year? This broad field which I have looked at so long looks not to me as a principal cultivator, but away from me two influences more genial to it which water and make it green. These beans have results which are not harvested by me. Do they not grow for woodchucks partly? The ear of wheat in Latin speca, obsoletely speca from spe hope, should not be the only hope of the husbandman. Its kernel or grain, granum from garendo, bearing, is not all that it bears. How then can our harvest fail? Shall I not rejoice also at the abundance of the weeds whose seeds are the granary of the birds? It matters like comparatively whether the fields fill the farmer's barns. The true husbandman will cease from anxiety, as the squirrels manifest no concern whether the woods will bear chestnuts this year or not, and finish his labor with every day, relinquishing all claim to the produce of his fields and sacrificing in his mind not only his first but his last fruits also.